Father, thank you so much for your loving kindness. Lord, how could we not consecrate our lives to you? How could we not, in light of all that you have done, not live our lives completely for your glory? We love you, Lord, and we pray that you would be with us this morning, that you would uh, open your word to us so that we might see and behold the marvelous things in your word. We love you, Lord. Teach us through the power of your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're resuming this morning our sequential exposition through the book of Second Peter. And this is part four of our series through Second Peter chapter two that I've entitled Exposing False Teachers. Exposing False Teachers. Today, there is a profound lack of discernment within the evangelical church. Professing Christians are beautifully bearing false teachers and their false doctrine and receiving them as if they were true. But true shepherds, true pastors are to discern between truth and error for the health of the flock. True pastors, they call out false teachers and false teaching. Titus 1.9, Paul says to Titus, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that you will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine, call someone to sound doctrine, and refute those who contradict. True shepherds spend a lot of their time refuting those who contradict the truth. 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul said to Timothy, pay close attention to yourself, your teaching, and persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation for both yourself and those who hear you. Pastors are to pay close attention to their character, their content, and their commitment. Oftentimes, pastors aren't paying attention to their content, and so they are not involved in seeing those saved who hear them preach. I'd like to draw your attention to Acts chapter 20. Notice verse 28. Here, this is the Apostle Paul's final words to the elders in Ephesus. After spending three years in the church of Ephesus, he gathered together the elders as it was time to depart them, and he said to them in verse 28, "'Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock.'" among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. To be an overseer, to be a true shepherd, is to be on guard for the flock. True pastors don't let false teachers ravage God's people. Verse 29 says, I know that after my departure, Paul says, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from, for your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. True shepherds admonish night and day. It doesn't end. It doesn't end because God's people are precious people. But not only are pastors to have discernment, to fight against false teaching and false teachers, but every Christian is called to discern between truth and error. First Thessalonians 5, 19 through 20, Paul says, do not quench the spirit and do not despise prophetic utterances. That's a reference to teaching, but examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. You bear upon your shoulders as a Christian the responsibility to examine everything carefully. 1 Corinthians 5.11 says, But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother or moral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Paul tells us that we are to discern the behavior of professing believers. I'd like to remind you where we are in 2 Peter. Please turn in your Bible to 2 Peter. As we're ramping up to jump back into our passage, I'd like to remind you uh, where we've been. Here's how I've decided to 
outline the passage, and I trust this will be helpful as we progress into our message this morning. First of all, we noted the rise of false teachers from within the church in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Then we noted the guard or the guaranteed judgment of false teachers in verses 4 through 10. After Peter tells uh, the church that he's writing to in this epistle that false teachers will come from within the church, he reminds them that false teachers are guaranteed judgment. I think it's an important thing to uh, rehash for just a moment. Oftentimes when we fe- see false teachers being successful, we think as believers, how does the Lord allow them to continue to be successful? We, we get concerned, it bothers us a little bit, that false teachers' ministries grow. But Peter reminds us that their judgment is guaranteed. Then, from there, we move to exposing false teachers within the church. And Peter does this in two ways. We spent three messages looking at their character. Looking at their character. Notice, beginning in verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter uses a series of metaphors to describe their character. First, he just outright says in verse 10b that they're daring and self-willed. Then in verse 12, he uses the metaphor that they're unreasoning animals. Then in verse 13, he calls them stains and blemishes. And then in verse 14, he calls them accursed children. And all of these metaphors highlight their bankrupt character. If you and I are going to discern between truth and error, if we're going to be able to spot false teachers, the first thing that we have to notice is the character of false teachers. But now in verse 17, notice the text. God willing, this morning, we're going to try to cover verses 17 through 22. Verse 17 is an interlude. Peter uses another metaphor, but this time the metaphor doesn't refer to the false teacher's character. The metaphor refers to the false teacher's teaching. What specifically are we to look for in teaching that would expose a teacher as being a false teacher? That's what Peter gets into in verses 17 through 20. He exposes false teachers by exposing their teaching. And then he closes this chapter with a warning um, about listening to false teachers. And we see that in verses 20 and 22. So let's begin then with our first point. And again, we're still on our four-part series. By the way, if this is your first time in this, we'd encourage you to go back and listen to those prior three messages. It'll give you a lot of context and be helpful for this message as well. But we're going to approach this uh, part four in two ways. First, we're going to look at the teaching of false teachers. And then we're going to look at the warning about listening to false teachers. So point number one The teaching of false teachers. The teaching of false teachers. Let's begin by noting the interlude in verse 17 and the metaphor in particular. Peter says, These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. He uses two metaphors. He calls them springs without water, or wells without water, and mists driven by a storm. These two metaphors are highlighting the emptiness of false teachers' teaching. The teaching of false teachers is empty. They are full of hot air, to use our modern-day vernacular, as we'll see Peter say something very similar in just a moment. They make huge, grandiose promises, but the things that they say are bankrupt and empty. Peter goes on to explain this. Notice in verse 18, For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. We're going to note four aspects of the teaching of false teachers in this point. Four aspects of the teaching of false teachers. First, they speak with exaggerated 
and empty words. They speak with exaggerated and empty words. Notice verse 18. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity. The word arrogant can be defined as swollen or overgrown. When used to describe one's speech, it means pompous, boastful, haughty, or bombastic. And the word vanity is defined by one lexicon as to being of no use, idle, empty, fruitless, useless, powerless, or lacking truth. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the New Testament that was around during the time of Christ, uses this same Greek word to describe human emptiness apart from God in the Old Testament. Listen to Psalm 39.6. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. Psalm 144.4 says, Man is like a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. That word breath is the same Greek word in the Septuagint as this word vanity, empty. Man's life, listen to this, man's life apart from God is vanity. Your life apart from God is absolutely meaningless. And the reason why is because you can spend your 80 years here amassing everything and squeezing every ounce of pleasure you can get out of this life and then enter into hell for an eternity and everything that you did here means absolutely nothing. But when you walk with God, the things that we do here matter and they matter for eternity. That's the idea. But false prophets, they, they're full of hot air. They make these grandiose or swollen promises, but they're actually empty. Now, in context, notice that the vanity or the emptiness of their speaking has to do with verse 19. We'll unpack this in just a moment, but look down at verse 19, where it says, A false teachers promise freedom while they themselves are slaves to corruption. The idea of what they're promising is they're promising that if you listen to them, you will be free of the guilt of your sin. Because as the text implies, what they're teaching is licentious living. He goes, hey, God is gracious. Go ahead and live on in your sin. And uh, you'll experience true freedom. But that swollen promise is empty and devoid of truth. I was looking for examples throughout the series. We've been playing video clips of false teachers. I'm not going to play one for you right now. But I was tempted to play one of a false teacher by the name of, um, oh my goodness, Lifestyle Christianity. Help me out here, somebody. Todd White, thank you. Uh, By the false teacher, Todd White. And Todd White just partnered with one of Benny Hinn's nephews and uh, started a church. And there's a video on Lifestyle Christianity, their YouTube channel, where Todd White makes a swollen claim. He says, the church that we are going to start is going to fundamentally change worldwide how the church does church. That's a swollen claim that's totally empty. This morning, someone just told me they got a robocall from Jensen Franklin's free chapel here in Irvine, who is also a false teacher, who said that they need to attend church today because there's going to be something unusual and perhaps miraculous at church this Sunday. False teachers make swollen claims that are devoid of any substance. True teachers, on the other hand, as we noted last week, preach the word. Preach the word. Point number two, second aspect of the teaching of false teachers. By the way, just stop and just think about this for a minute. If you're wrestling with this question, how do I know if a Bible teacher is true or false? Well, is the preacher making huge claims that are empty, that are impossible for something to come through. That's the first litmus test you could use, so to speak. But secondly, false teachers or the teaching of false teachers aims to entice the flesh. Aims to entice the flesh. Notice the text again with me. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires... 
by sensuality. Notice the word entice. Do you see that word entice? In classical Greek, this word has been used to describe something uh, or to describe a lure that is used as bait. False teachers are baiting people into following them. And it's important to stop here and ask ourselves the question, why are you here this morning? Or to say it a different way, why are you following Jesus Christ? Are you here because of what your fleshly desires or your sensuality can get out of it? Why are you here? You see, false teachers, they lure people into their churches, lure people into listening to their messages. Notice, according to Peter, by two means. There are two things I want to bait you with. Number one, fleshly desires. In 1 Peter 2.11, Peter said, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. In Romans 8.13, we read, For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Fleshly desire is something that you don't need to be regenerate to want. In fact, the word flesh is sarx, which just means flesh. Paul often connects this to sin. And the word desire can also mean lust. The idea here is is that false teachers offer people things that don't require regeneration to want. When we first planted Revolve Bible Church, we used to say, at our church, we don't have anything that, the un, that appeals to the unregenerate. To know Christ, to walk with Christ, is to be born spiritually and to long for things other than fleshly things. Sometimes we ask, how do false teachers amass such large followings? Well, the answer is, is they're baiting people with things of the flesh. Hey, come to my church and you'll be rich. Come to my church and bring your ailments and we'll heal all your physical problems. Come to my church and you can look as pretty as the people on the stage look. Come to my church and your life can look like my life. You see, those are all baits that entice the flesh. In other words, one commentator says, this is an encouragement to do whatever feels good. He writes, these teachers entice people because they do not put boundaries on the physical drives and thus encourage others to do whatever feels good. If it feels good, do it. But false teachers add to that this, and God's okay with it. Notice, not only do false teachers appeal, or I'm sorry, aim to entice the flesh, but they also encourage sensuality. Notice the text. For speaking arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality. This word sensuality attached to fleshly desires. Sensuality here refers to a lack of self-constraint, which involves um, one's conduct that violates all bounds that are socially acceptable. Sensuality is not necessarily a sexual term, but it's a term that describes releasing boundaries. You need to understand something, and I trust you'll understand it as we progress this morning if you don't already, that to come to Christ is to, is to live within boundaries, To come to Christ is to be constrained by the Holy Spirit. To be constrained by the Word of God, the truth of God. To not be a Christian is to live outside of that constraint. It's called sin. And it deserves judgment according to Scripture. But sensuality is often used and connected to sexual sin. For example, Romans 13, 13 says, Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, and not in sexual promiscuity, not sensuality, and not in strife and jealousy. No restraint. And by the way, I 
want to combine these two things together, fleshly desire, which is things that you desire that are devoid of the Spirit, and sensuality is taking the reins off of those desires. But let's just drill down and make sure that we're crystal clear about what fleshly desires are. We've gone here many times. I think we've gone here in the series as well, but I just want to take you there again. I have no problem reminding you. Turn to Galatians 5.16. Galatians 5.16. In Galatians, Paul is exhorting the church of Galatia to walk by the Spirit in this particular passage. And he, as he exhorts the church in Galatia, and subsequently you and I, to walk by the Spirit, he tells us the opposite of walking by the Spirit, by walking in the flesh. These are fleshly desires. These are the things that false teachers are going to bait people with. 5.16, we read, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. What is in your flesh that is the opposite of the Spirit of God? Verse 17, For the flesh lets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, here we go, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarned you and have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. False teachers bait people into coming to their church, coming into their ministry, listening to their messages with things that ensure you will not inherit the kingdom of God. To say it another way, they're entertaining the goats. False teachers are entertaining Christians who have an, em- so-called Christians rather, who have an empty profession of faith. But let's look at the third point, the third aspect of the teaching of false teachers. They appeal to a particular audience. Notice, turn back to the text if you're not there, 2 Peter 18. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. Notice that the teaching of false teachers appeals to a particular audience. Those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. Now here, it's important to note, for our purposes, kind of a passing comment, that there are textual differences here that make some interpretation difficult. Some believe that this group of people, or the audience that false teachers appeal to, are Recent converts. Recent converts. Some people would argue that those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. And then notice the word barely. That word barely, according to what word you're implying, or even a a word that's similar to the one underneath the text in the NAS, could be translated recently. Recently. So some would argue that this reads, who recently escaped the ones in error, meaning referring to new converts. But it could also refer to unsaved people. I believe that's the reference here. I think that's the plainest reading of the text. I think it refers to people that are interested in Christianity. The reason I think this is because, and we'll note this later, it is impossible to mislead the elect. One of the questions that comes up when we start studying false teachers and the mandate of elders to uh, deal with false teachers is, can true Christians lose their salvation? Can true believers be led away from the truth permanently? Well, the answer to that is no, and we'll make that case explicitly or in greater detail in just a moment, but Matthew 24, 24 says, 
listen to the Lord, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, listen to this, so as to mislead, and there's a parenthetical phrase, if possible, the elect. It is impossible to permanently mislead the elect. So the group of people that Peter's referencing here, that false teachers are are getting to listen to them and follow them, are not recent converts, but rather they refer to unsaved people. On this point, John MacArthur in his commentary has a helpful paragraph that gives little insight into who this group of people are. Listen to this. He writes, This group of people are men and women who through moral resolution are trying to better themselves. They include people who struggle with broken relationships, wrestle with emotional felt needs and spiritual problems, and they desperately desire relief from guilt, anxiety, and stress. They are dissatisfied with the lifestyle of the ones who live in error, the average mass of unregenerate humanity, and seek some better way to live or some form of religious experiment experience, end quote. I think that Peter is saying here that false teachers uh, appeal to people that have come to the church to check it out because they're, they're sick of what's going on in their life. They've recently come out of a bad relationship or maybe it's a mother who has children and wants their children to grow up in the church because they didn't but that mom still has not been converted to Christ and isn't following Jesus on her own. Maybe it refers to some of you that are present this morning. You're interested in Christianity because you're sick of the world. You found that the parties are empty and that the promises of the people in the world are bankrupt. You're interested in Christianity but you've really not yet come all the way to Christ for one reason or another. I think that's the group of people that Peter's saying here. Those people are people that are particularly susceptible to the false teachers. And by the way, the Bible talks about these people quite a bit. I'd like to just draw your attention to two notable examples. Would you turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 8 with me? Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, we read, Now then, Simeon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, and he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I may lay hands and may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought that you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. By the way, believe it or not, as a pastor, I've had people want to meet with me and upon arriving at the meeting, them hand me a check and say, you can have this check if you do dot, dot, dot. People that do that, their hearts are not right with the Lord and they think that by their money, they can buy their will in the church. It doesn't work that way. Simeon had a similar problem. He was enthralled with this gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, there are people that attach themselves to the church for reasons that are not saving, so to speak. I wonder if that's you. I wonder if you're here for anything else other than to know God. There's another example, perhaps more stinging to uh, an American church audience. Turn your Bible with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark 
In Mark chapter 10, there's much that could be said in this particular encounter with Christ, but I'd just like to draw your attention to something that is poignant in this passage. Notice in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, in the rich young ruler. And he was setting out on a journey. A man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now this is a, a young man that approached Jesus. He's called a ruler, which means he would have overseen a synagogue. So he knew some of the Old Testament. He was rich, so the Old Testament people, the Jews, would have thought that he was blessed by God because he had money. This is a young guy that really had everything going for him, but he runs to Jesus and he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Revealing that in his heart, he knows he's not saved. He's religious. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're here this morning and you come to church all the time and you're around the people of God and you're really exploring this Christian thing, but you know in your heart you don't have eternal life. This was this guy. He runs up to Jesus, and Jesus says to him in verse 18, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandment. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Honor your father and mother. Jesus' answer is, you want to go to heaven? Then just perfectly obey the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. But notice Jesus doesn't give all the commandments. He omits some of them. He's baiting the guy. Because Jesus knows his heart. Verse 20, and he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all things from my youth up. But looking at him, Jesus felt love for him. He said, but one thing you lack. This guy was idolatrous. He was covetous. He loved money. But one thing you lack. Go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But at these words, he was saddened and went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Notice Jesus invited this young man to follow him, but instead of following him, he went away. This guy's unsaved. And the reason he's unsaved is because of his refusal to repent. He had broken the law because what his true love was, was money. And he loved God, and he loved going to the synagogue every Saturday. But there was a part of his life that was off limits to Jesus Christ. Jesus looks at him and feels love and says, you're unwilling to repent. And the guy walks away sad. You see, there's a group of people that attach themselves to the church that that they're not in it because they want to know Christ. Because they love him. Because of how he first loved him. There's some other motivation, some other reason These are the people that the false teachers aim at. Listen, because it's just a matter of time before you start heaping up for yourselves teachers in accordance with your own desires because of your refusal to repent. It's just a matter of time. And all you need is a bombastic hot air balloon to come and tell you, you can have everything your flesh wants and still be a Christian. That's what false teachers do. Particularly the false teachers that Peter's talking about here. In John 17, 3, Jesus said this, this is eternal life. You want eternal life? What is it? It's not just duration of life. In fact, the word life that Jesus uses here in John 17, 3 is not the word for biology. It's not bios. It's a word that refers to quality of life as well. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know Christ, and it is to know God. As John Piper says, God is the gospel. When we come to Christ, what we get is a relationship with God, and that's why we're here, because we want to know him. The teaching of the false teachers has another component, according to Peter. The fourth component is that they promise what they cannot deliver. Notice verse 19. Turn back to the text if you're not there. In 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, notice verse 19. Promising them freedom, 
while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. The fourth aspect of the teaching of false teachers is that they promise what they cannot deliver. They promise freedom from sin. The word for corruption, notice in verse 19, they promise freedom while they themselves are slaves to corruption. The word corruption refers to moral corruption. How do they promise a freedom uh, that when they themselves are enslaved? Well, it seems that these false teachers held to a form of what we call today antinomianism. I've talked about antinomianism a little bit before, but i just like to kind of remind you about what antinomianism is. That's a big word. We don't use it anymore. It's really just a combination of two Greek words, anti, which is against, and nomos, nomos, or nomos, sorry, which is law, the Greek word for law, anti-law. Antinomians are people that tell you that because God is so gracious, he doesn't care about the way that you live your life. Today, antinomianism comes in two forms. The first form, and this is not my wording, this is, comes from a book, but my, the first form is that antinomianists, or people who hold to antinomianism today, and this seems to be the form of who Peter's referring to in this passage, they teach grace, not law. Because God's grace is greater than all our sin, we no long, are, no, are no longer under any obligation to obey God's law, some would say, or anti-law. The idea would be something like this. Hey, God is gracious, man. He doesn't care how you live. Don't you know what Jesus did on the cross? He came and he gave his life to free you from the penalty of sin. And doesn't Romans say where sin abounds, grace superabounds? God doesn't care about the way that you live. You need to be free from that burden of guilt that you're holding. You need to be free from the sense of conviction that's in your heart. Come and be like us. We, we are free. We don't worry about how we act or how we live. Wow, I can be a Christian and live however I want, the antinomians would teach. No, it's a heresy. We don't have time to get into the historical origins of this particular heresy. But there's also another form of antinomianism, which is the justification-only form. And this is the form that's really popular in Reformed Christianity. This is a group that says, faith does not result in a believer's following a path of obedience. The idea here is this is a group of Christians that only focus on justification. Now, some of the origins of this form in particular really were the result of Lutheranism and Martin Luther. Martin Luther had amazing contributions to Christianity, and he is a reformer that we love, and we're so very thankful for him. But he's not Jesus Christ, he's not God, and he had some serious theological pitfalls. One of the things that Luther would do is he was so captured by justification that he would read through the whole Bible and his hermeneutic, his method of interpretation, was asking if the particular passage he was reading was law or gospel. And so he would often be tempted to omit the duty aspect of God's word and focus on just, hey, we're justified. And so because of that, there is a form of Lutheranism that exists still to this day that is antinomian. The way that you live really doesn't matter. It's all about justification. But that's not what the Bible says. You see, Jesus came and he died to set us free from the punishment of the law. But he also came so that we might have life. 
And as the Holy Spirit has regenerated us, we have come alive to righteousness. Or to use the language of Paul, we have become slaves to righteousness. True Bible teachers, true teachers from God, do not encourage license in living. Rather, they encourage holiness and sanctification. Why? Because true salvation always results in becoming a slave to righteousness. Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 17, we read, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, doulos, it's the word slave, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, And having been freed from sin, notice verse 18, you became slaves of what? Hear me. Every human being in the world is a slave. It's not are you a slave, it's what are you a slave to? Look at verse 18. You are either a slave to sin or you are a slave to righteousness. And there's no middle ground. You are either constrained by the Spirit of God to live a righteous life, or you are enslaved to sin. How do I know, Pastor Ryan, which one I am? Well, Peter answers that. Turn back to 2 Peter with me. Notice again verse 19, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves to corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is what? The word overcome means to be vanquished, to be defeated, or to succumb to. What overcomes you? What has vanquished you? What you have succumbed to, what controls you, according to verse 19, is what you are enslaved to. You know what you're a slave to by what you are succumbed to. Is Paul saying here that Christians never sin? No, we sin. We're not Nazarenes right? They believe in perfect sanctification. The idea is that you can become perfect in this life. That's not what the Bible teaches. We are, as Martin Luther said, he said a lot of good things, we are simultaneously just and yet sinful. We don't live perfect lives, but the general trajectory and practice of our lives as believers, true believers, is righteousness. And to embrace any other perspective of Christianity makes you a target of false teachers. Because the Spirit of God works in moral renewal. Moving on. Point number two for this morning. We noticed four aspects of the false teacher's teaching. Peter in verse 20 now shifts to a warning about listening to false teachers. Now, he does this as he begins to unpack the characteristics of their teaching, but it's as if Peter can't quickly uh, or quick enough get to what happens to false teachers and what happens to those who go after them. Well, he says that in verses 20 through 22. Let's read together. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them 
than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to a true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow or sow, pig, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. Here, Peter warns about us about listening to false teachers and those who would be tempted to listen to them. Now, as we unpack this briefly, there is a couple interpretive challenges here. I'm going to just give those to you at the outset. First, the first challenge in interpreting verses 20 through 22 is asking the question, who does Peter refer to when he says they? Notice verse 20. For after they, who is the they in mind? Some say that the they in mind is the false teachers. Some say that the they in mind is those who listen to false teachers. Others say that Peter probably has both in mind. I think both in mind are true. I think he's saying what's going to happen, or has happened rather, to the false teachers. And he's also warning those who would follow after them, saying that they will have the same fate. So my perspective is that Peter here is referring to the false teachers, but the, by implication, he's also warning those who would follow after them. But the second interpretive challenge is this. Is Peter implying that someone can lose their salvation? These verses, verses 20 through 22, are often used by Arminians to argue that people can lose their salvation. Notice verse 20. For after they have escaped the defilements of the world with the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them. Now again, some people read this verse and the verses that follow and believe that Peter is warning Christians not to listen to false teachers because false teachers can actually uh, have such an impact that Christians who listen to them will lose their salvation. Now, I don't think that's what Peter's saying here. I don't think Peter is saying that Christians can lose their salvation. I don't think he's saying that the false teachers were truly saved, and then they came to Christ, and then after coming to Christ, they rejected Christ. I don't think that's what Peter's saying. Without going into the technical details, there's really four different perspectives of how this verse could be interpreted, but I'll just give you mine for the sake of time. I believe that what Peter is doing here is using phenomenal logical language. Now, a literal grammatical historical hermeneutic does mean that we have to take into consideration literary forms. For those of you that were here on Wednesday night, we hammered that, right? Literal grammatical historical hermeneutic. If the word hermeneutic is new to you, hermeneutic just means the science of interpretation. So when we're thinking about interpreting the Bible, everybody applies a hermeneutic, some type of interpretive method that they either know or unknowingly read into the Bible to take out meaning from it. Most of the people that you meet that don't have any time seriously studying the Bible have a me-centric hermeneutic, and they typically say things like this, well, to me, this passage means, listen, I don't care what it means to you, and neither should you. You should care what the original author meant to the original audience. How did we get that? By a literal, historical, grammatical hermeneutic. Literal meaning authorial intent or uh, contextual. What was the author's original intent? What's the context of the passage? Grammatical, what does the original language say? What's the grammar of the passage and what was going on historically? Now, when we read the Bible with a literal, uh, grammatical, historical hermeneutic, When we take into consideration context, what falls underneath that category is also understanding literary forms. For example, one of the ones that you've heard me say before is anthropomorphic language. Remember what that is? Language that's human. Anthropomorphic language or language that humans can understand. When the Bible says that God has a right hand, does God really have a right hand? God the Father. No, John 4 says God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. When it says that God the Father has eyes, does God the Father really have eyes? No. Anthropomorphic language is a literary form of, of, of literature that communicates to us in a way that we can intelligibly understand. When the Bible says that God has eyes, we don't think he actually has eyes. 
but we do interpret that as he knows what's going on. Does that make sense? It's called anthropomorphic language. It's a literary form. Here, there's another literary form, I believe, called phenomenological language. What is phenomenological language? You use it every day. You're like, what? I didn't even know that I did that. I'm amazing. <laughs> Here's an example of phenomenological language. Phenomenological language is uh, language that describes way, the way things appear to the naked eye. When I say, today the sun is rising in the east, that's phenomenal logical language. Did the sun actually rise? No, we're actually the ones spinning. The sun did not rise, but it's phenomenal logical language to say, from my perspective, the way things appear to the naked eye, the phenomenon that I saw was that the sun rose, but we know that the sun doesn't actually rise. Are you with me? I think Peter's using phenomenological language here, meaning from our perspective, it looked like these group of false teachers that arose from within the church, remember uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it looks like they were truly what? Saved. But just because they looked like it did not make it so. The rest of the New Testament is crystal clear on the subject of whether or not a true Christian can lose their salvation. True Christians cannot lose their salvation. As we noted earlier, Matthew 24, 24, that there are false prophets who will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as, if possible, to mislead the elect. Listen to this, John 6, 37, Jesus says this, 37 through 39, all that the Father gives me, speaking of people that get saved, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. He goes on in verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me I lose nothing. Who are those that the Father has given the Son? He says, but I will raise it up on the last day. All of those who are in Christ and will experience glory and bodily resurrection. All that the Father gives the Son, the Son does not lose a single one. John 10, 28, Jesus says, And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and, the one who, uh, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Listen, when you come to Christ, you have eternal, what? Life. Does eternal life end? If it did, it wouldn't be eternal. All that go to Christ have eternal life, and your eternal life is secure because Christ won't let you go. Nor will the Father. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation? Will distress? Will persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? But in all these things, you are overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth, listen to this, or any other created thing will separate us from the love of Christ. Can I ask you a question? Are you a created thing? No created thing can separate Christians from the love of Christ. That includes yourself. You can't even separate yourself from the love of Christ. I like what John MacArthur says. He says that the reason why you can't lose your salvation is because you didn't do anything to earn your salvation. If you didn't do anything to get it on the front end, you can't do anything to undo it on the back end. Back to the text. So here when Peter says, for if after they have 
escape the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior. They are again entangled to them and are overcome. The last day has become worse for them than the first. This is phenomenal logical language, I believe. But what happens to someone who comes to the church, hears the gospel, it looks like they're with us, and it looks like their life starts to get changed a little bit, but they embrace the teaching of a false teacher and they leave. Well, according to Peter, their last state has become worse than their first. Listening to false teachers makes your last state worse than the first for two reasons. Number one, it is potentially easier to sin. Think about this logically with me for a minute. Someone comes in and they're not a Christian, but they're here because they're sick of the world. They're sick of those who are perishing. They're sick of the partying. They're sick of the lies. They're sick of the drama. They're sick of everything that they're doing. And they come into the church and they're like, wow, there's peace here. Not everybody's all over the place. There's a settledness and you begin to enjoy the fellowship of the people of God who are slaves to righteousness but you're still struggling with loving your sin. And you've refused to repent and come all the way to Christ and a false teacher comes along and says, hey, it's okay. Jesus is gracious. You can be a homosexual and be a Christian. You can keep living that way and be a Christian. It's okay. God is gracious. Oh, really? And that false teacher gives you license to pursue sin. In a very practical sense, it's now easier to sin. So when you came in, there was something restraining you. And a false teacher has convinced you that the grace of God encourages sensuality. You can go and Live in sin without restraint. Don't be surprised when you start to go to a false church that everyone that you're sitting next to that's got their hands raised and yelling out at Jesus has sensuality in their life as a permanent practice. But there's another reason, and we maybe rather than a logical reason, a biblical reason, And a penetrating reason, and that is simply this, that they will be judged with a stricter judgment. There is a sense in which there is nothing more dangerous you could be doing this morning than sitting in that seat. Because God is going to hold you accountable to what you do with Jesus Christ. Jesus warned the city of Bethsaida and Cherozan because they had seen miracles performed in them by Jesus, but Jesus pronounced judgment on those cities and saying that in the final judgment, it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than it was for those cities because they denied the Savior. What you do with Jesus Christ after hearing the gospel, God will eternally keep you accountable to that. And if you're here and you've attached yourself to the church for any other reason than knowing Jesus Christ and knowing God through Christ and loving Christ because of what he did for you on the cross, you are in a very dangerous place because you are trampling underfoot the Son of God. And God takes that very seriously. We'll close with two passages. Please turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 6. Today there's this, I think it, I say today, but maybe it's been like this since the beginning. There are, I think, false teachers mostly that 
that want to paint this picture of Jesus as if he's not a conquering king and a great warrior. There are people that like to paint this picture of God that as if God is not a wrathful God. But the picture of God in the Bible is that God is a God of judgment. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of grace. He is a God of love. And by the way, we're hammering judgment and we're hammering false things. We're going to go to the book of Galatians after 2 Peter. And uh, we're going to look at true faith, which is going to be a great time. Hang in there. We'll get to the grace and the love and the mercy. But just understand that the picture of God in the Bible is a picture that God is a God of judgment. Notice Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, same thing, phenomenological language, I think, and been tested of the, tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, And have tested the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. And then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. The book of Hebrews, we're not entirely sure who the author is. It could be Apollos. It could be Paul. It could be someone else. We're not entirely sure. That's why the book of Hebrews is not labeled by the author's name. As a, as a broadly circulated letter would be like First Peter or Second Peter, it's named by the recipients. The book of Hebrews is written to Hebrews. It's written to a group of professing Christians that are Hebrew. They're coming out of Judaism. But they're tempted because of persecution to leave Christ behind and go back into Judaism. The context of this passage in verse 6 is the author of Hebrews is saying to them, listen, you've, you've, you've tasted the things of Christ. If you go back to Judaism, you are once again crucifying Christ and putting him to open shame. He picks this theme up again in chapter 10. Turn to chapter 10 with me. And notice verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume his adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment, think about this. Now, remember, he's talking to a group of Jewish people. You ignore the law of Moses. In the Jewish law, there is severe punishment for that. How much more severe, verse 29, do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? And has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Vengeance is mine. The gospel is good news. That's what the word means. And the good news is that although we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, God has sent his son to die in our place so that when we place our faith in Jesus, we are forgiven from the punishment that the law demands. The gospel was God's idea, it's not a human invention. Paul says that it is the gospel of God. Not only is it God's idea that in the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. But the gospel is also a command. Do you understand that biblically speaking, the Bible does not invite you to come to Jesus? But it commands you to come. And when God commands you to come and you refuse, how much more severe your punishment will be 
for insulting the spirit of grace and trampling underfoot the Son of Christ. You need to come and you need to come today. You need to not risk one more moment of living your life outside of the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't know if you'll die today. You don't know if you'll get in a car accident on the way home. You do not want to leave here without responding to his command to come into his fold. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this last couple months that has equipped us to identify false teachers. Lord, we come humbly before you knowing that that we are not what we want to be and we are not what we should be. And so, Father, we ask that you would forgive us our sin and be near to us. And we thank you that we can come and boldly confess knowing that Christ has already forgiven all of our sin. Lord, we ask for our church that you would make us discerning. We ask that you would make every person a Berean, that they might labor to know your word and to examine every sermon, to examine every word of man to see if it matches up with the word of God. Lord, we pray that you would use us to call our friends and family members who are stuck underneath false teachers. And that, Lord, we ask that you would grant them repentance so that they could come. We love you, Lord. How we love your law and how it arms us and clarifies things in this world. May we be good stewards of your word. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.